Well, Puddles and I are here in Kansas City. Uh, happy to be with Wyatt Henderson. Wyatt, it's so good to see you. Good to see you too, Mike. Wyatt and I were in uh, school together at Northwestern. We were at Civic together, Malar Brass Ensemble. Prior to that, you were at University of North Texas. All right. And then uh, after Chicago, you went on to the Grand Rapids Symphony. And then in 1990, you came here to Kansas City Easy. Symphony. Yeah. Congratulations. Well, thanks. Belatedly. Belated. I think I've uh, said congratulations. Well, you know, about 23 years late. That's okay. Yeah. And Wyatt also has uh, had some studies uh, with, with Mr. Jacobs. Wyatt, I'm wondering if you can uh, um, recount your first lesson or first few lessons or you know, how, what, what brought you to Jake in the first place. Mm -hmm. Well, of course, I've been at, at Northwestern for grad school and studied with Mr. Chris Filley and um, also with Mr. Klein Hammerson. And I've been trying to get in with Jake for a while, and of course it takes a few calls and attempts to get in, yeah. <laughs> to get in for a lesson. I got my first lesson, uh, I think it's probably about May of 1985, um, and then I was gone for the summer after that, and then I started studying regularly in the fall of 85, um, and continued on actually more or less until he, until he passed. I had uh, studied really regularly for a couple of years in Chicago, and then the three years I was in Grand Rapids, I would come back once a month or so to take lessons. And then I got up there several times, uh, usually three or four times a year when I was in Kansas City. I'd make a trip up there. Uh, the thing I know, thought was kind of surprising in my first couple of lessons is that he really didn't talk about breathing because I went in expecting to be the total breathing. You heard the stories. I heard the stories. I thought I'd be hooked up to some machine and all these tests or something. I didn't know what was going to happen, but there'd be this huge breathing analysis and I'd find out what I was doing wrong with my breathing. All right. And instead, he was talking about conceiving this, the sound in your, in your brain and flooding your brain with the sound and the connection of the of your brain to your lip and, and all the whole song aspect of it as opposed to the wind of it. And so, which was great because it was, it was you know, really helpful to my playing and it opened up uh, a huge, uh, a huge avenues to explore in that. Right. And, but fine, and, but it's just, you never, never said anything about breathing. So finally, probably the second or third lesson, I think we were almost, you know, halfway through and I said, um, so, uh, how's my breathing? Is it, he just, oh, you're fine. Just take big breaths and you'll be fine. It's like, what? That's it. I'm supposed to get so. And later on, in later lessons, he, I think he hear me a little bit and I test my vital capacity, check my vital capacity and do some of the breathing gizmos and stuff. But my breathing was actually pretty good having studied with some really good teachers before then. So. Yeah. It wasn't really an issue, but it was just totally the opposite of what I expected because I expected really uh, the the breathing lesson, and, and instead it was really the the song lesson, which was which is what I needed at the time. And that's what uh, that's probably what you encountered. Did you encounter that more or less the same curriculum through your the rest of your studies, or did you was there a time when you got maybe it got more technical or more physically oriented? Did it remain? Mentally oriented? For the most part, I mean, it was always that was always the impetus that there was some sort of technical problem is always changing your the mental aspect of it and and of course it was some totally new repertoire because instead of doing the most of the standard stuff I've been doing we do like the Charlie A twos and the Smith top tones and the Patek A twos which were which were new to me I actually didn't like Rochu he didn't, when I was studying with him really, which I thought was kind of odd I would play them occasionally just like oh too much like Pablo all the same you know, so. right. I didn't play much Rochu but uh, but yeah, but it's always based on that, on what you're doing musically, the, the appropriate um, mental construction if we want to have physically, instead of try, of course, instead of trying to fix your tongue or fix this or that or embouchure by controlling, it, controlling the individual muscles. It's what's your mental stimulus to get that problem fixed. So, so it sounds like he was going after repertoire maybe to address issues or ways to improve what was already there. He was he was going after certain etudes, using certain etudes to make things better. I think so. It's a, different, lots of different styles of things, I think, to try to, I think he'd be forgetting any kind of rut. I think, I think that was the reason he probably didn't like Rochu, is that it, because it's all the same kind of thing. It's great, mm -hmm. but that's all you, that's kind of all the, that's all you do. Whereas like in the Patek book, you, there are a gazillion different kinds of styles of piece. Right. Um, and the and of course in the Charlier and the Smith you've got a lot of technical challenges but they're musically pretty decent too, but you've um, but you've got the and I think you do that embouchure development by doing these really technical kind of etudes like the Smith things you work on your high range but you're not just banging away at like you know high E flats or something you're right. in the progress of 
playing these pieces over and over, you're getting up to the upper register and working on things that way. So I didn't I realize that I didn't realize that he had the that he signed top tones for the trombones. Yeah, I'm trying to do that. Charlier, oh. you know, of course, Arben. Well, Arben, of course, we've done before. They used a trumpet book, Schlossberg. Yeah. But he used the trumpet books for those, too, in terms of trombone version. So right. it was kind of weird, to actually, when I got, actually had to read anything in bass flat. I do remember him uh, talking about Roshu and, and just saying that uh, he wished trombonists would branch out. Um, you know, because we, well, there were occasionally we would have a... Uh, Roshu was definitely part of... The tuba, mm. at least my diet anyway, but there was the top tones, the Arbins, mm. the Potags, and Schlossbergs. Yeah. But I guess. Uh, and I had done, and of course, by that point, I had done, you know, I don't know how many thousands of hours I played Roshu, so that probably wasn't the thing I needed to do, right. <laughs> I needed to do so much. Right. Well, what, uh, what kept you coming back through those 13 years? Well, the, the main thing is you always ended up presenting the best you ever had at the end of the lesson. I mean, Came out of there sounding great, and you thought, "Man, I'm just, I'm totally the stud, man. I am, I'm, 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 I am, I am it." And then you go home, and of course, it would gradually get a little, little not so much. <laughs> you know, and then you go back for another one. But at one point in that lesson, you felt like, "Man, I can, I can do this. I can play with anybody. I can, I can get a job in an orchestra, or I can get a better job in, in a better orchestra. Yeah. Um, I can." You really could fulfill your potential. At least for that bit, and and like that was his knack. He could whoever and everybody else I talked to would have that same experience of, man, I got there just playing great, and learning to carry that over into your auditions and into your orchestra life is another challenge. But you had that that time of man, he has got me. I know I can do this, and I've gotten a glimpse of what it is to you know, to to play like to play like the greats. Sometimes it was only a glimpse, and then he went back. But it was at least you had that moment of okay, I know I can. I can do this. Yeah, if you can do it once, you can do it. You can do it again. And, and again, again and again. Yeah, it, from, if you can do it once, if you can manifest the physical capabilities to do that once, to have the mental come out, mm -hmm. then you can do it again. You just have to make yourself do it. Yeah. That's, uh, that's pretty cool. Well, why, you, you were talking about being the stud in your lesson and feeling... <laughs> briefly. Briefly, <laughs> briefly. <laughs> I'm wondering, though, what, uh, were, were there some specific manifestations of that stubbiness that you can describe? <laughs> well, <my> Music, <laughs> mu <laughs> musical <laughs> manifestations. Oh, okay. Um, let's see. Well, actually, one of the big things I think we worked on uh, consistently was um, there was a thing he would do. I, almost every book I have when I go back and look has the two lines. There's like a little line for the air pressure yeah. and the big line for the air flow. Yeah, and that was that seemed to come up a lot. I would often be working on lots of airflow, but not air pressure. Particularly when we got into, um, you know, the loud, bang, you know, the ride of the Valkyries or the you know Mahler threes, the big, the big stuff, getting that flow instead of the pressure. So that seemed to be one of the things that cropped up a lot, especially when I go back and every dude has the two lines. In, but um, that probably and, and probably like initial attacks, you've got the sound going right from the get go. So you get like a nice. Ah, beginning instead of a or some subpar sound. Mm -hmm. Working on getting your initial sound great and not having it be okay, and then really get into it as you go. That seemed to be the some of the bigger things that I that I worked on at that point. Getting that uh, that first attack golden and keep and then keeping that so that it wasn't easy. One note teaches the next. Right. You know, so you start out with a great note, and then and thereafter, I mean, two notes at a time, kind of building. Uh, building your phrase note by note, you've got a whole bunch of great notes. Mm -hmm. Instead of starting in, gradually warming up to it. That was a, a consistent theme I, I noticed um, through there. That sounds that good. good. And you, 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 at Northwestern, you were studying with Mr. Chris Foley, mm -hmm. and um, uh, what a sound that he had. And I'm wondering, what, what was that like? What was the, was there any overlap between what you were getting between those two teachers? I'm sure there was some different things, but mm -hmm. what, what, what was And they're it? definitely very complimentary. I mean, they didn't use the same verbiage so much, but uh, Mr. Chris really was all about, uh, you know, playing relaxed, enjoying the sound, enjoying the breath is one of his Enjoying phrases. the breath. Oh, enjoy like the that. breath, John. Um, um, and not getting freaked out by the technical aspects of it, you know, moving the slide over, <laughs> you know, and, and then you get all choked up and tight because you're moving the slide back and forth and doing all that stuff. Um, 
I think, I think as we said, it, a lot of things Mr. Christopher Lee would say would sound like, you know, you listen to him say something, he tell you something, you think, well, it's just common sense, but nobody's really ever told me that before, so <laughs> maybe it's not so common. But it was very relaxed, enjoying what you're doing, very music, very musically oriented. Um, we didn't do a lot of technical, uh, there wasn't a lot of technical talk about your embouchures doing this or that, you know, you would do a lot of work on style and the musical aspect of it, which is where Jake was coming from too, although he obviously had a lot more of the medical terminology and, and things like that sometimes. Mm -hmm. So you would you would sit there with him and listen, like, do you, you must know everything about everything. <laughs> he just, like, how do you know all this stuff? You know, it's just kind of miraculous. Like, you know, anything you wanted to know, he could explain it to you. So I remember you yeah. telling, telling uh, earlier how he knew or he told you why you were hungry after. Yeah, why you're uh, yeah, why you're hungry. At, brass players are hungry after concerts. You know, it's yeah, like, it's like it's like he does know everything. It's like even even the post concert he does. It's like it's uh, a, it's a change in the in the pH level. Yeah, those those of you at home wanting to know. Yeah, because yeah, yeah, you're blowing because blowing all the air, right? You yeah, change your pH level. The, and the, the exchange uh, of, of of gases. Yeah. So um, so so really, your your body demands that you go out for. The beer and the burger after the concert. So, it's all very predictable. Yeah, it's it's you know for your health, for your health, you need to cut it. Now <laughs> with uh, I remember uh, the the very few times that I was able to join the Chicago Symphony as a sub or as an extra, being attracted to of course Bud's sound, Mr. Mm -hmm. Herseth, and also Mr. Crucifoli's sound. I mean, it's really this interesting sound. It's very very raw, and I know you know up close. I know in lessons with Jake. When he would play, it was this unbelievably resonant sound. It was in no way velvety, but it was just incredible. Uh, and, but it was different out in the hall. Did you notice anything like that when you were? Yeah, I mean, it's definitely that with Mr. Chris Foley too. There were his, but he, his sound was always really, really centered, really in tune. Um, I think he was really, really accurate as far as you know where he's going slide wise and like that. So that, uh, like, so we heard him up close. I mean, certainly standard five, you're not thinking, you know, I'm expecting this huge, dark, round sound up close, which it wasn't so much. It was this, it was this very centered focus sound. But when you got on the hall, it turned into that big, that big bullet giant sound out there. So I think, I think the lesson there is, is and I've noticed it by some other, other players too, um, if playing the, playing the orchestra, what you sound like on stage is not really the thing because it's, really there's nobody on stage except for your colleagues maybe listening to you. It's what you're gonna sound like in the hall. And those guys from their youth were playing in, in orchestras. They weren't playing so much brass quintet or solo recitals and things like most most of us do these days, where you play every kind of thing. Yeah. They're playing in big halls and orchestras, and that's and that's where it counted. That's where the money was. But from the podium back was where it counted. What it sounded like in front of your stand it didn't matter so much. Yeah. Um, so I think sometimes it's easy to get into being an expert in your practice room, <laughs> but. There's there's nobody in that space really that, that at least nobody that's, that's that's paying the bills is going to be in that space. They're all going to yeah. be out further. So, um, kind of really thinking you know mentally thinking about your sound being out there as opposed to right next to you is worth that. But yeah, definitely Mr. C would. Uh, all he didn't sound. I wouldn't say you sounded sounded bad up close, but it was but it was a different sound. It wasn't what you were expecting. But then when you hear but hearing him in the hall and hearing that blend with everybody else and kind of keeping the the whole section unified. And, and, and what's funny is that everybody in that trombone section really used different equipment, used different, hey, really kind of had different sounds if you heard them individually. Very much different. You know, but they're renowned for how unified they sounded as a section. You know, when you listen to the, you know, the excerpt album, that old excerpt album where they made, there's some an old quartet album that's been released yeah. now, and or hearing them live, it's like, wow, they sound unified. They must all, surely they're all playing the same kind of instrument and have and, the, and, and of course, they never played together except for on stage. You know, they didn't have like sectionals or go play like that. There's a quartet recording that's out now that was like the only time they ever played quartets. And I think that was when Glenn Dodson was there, I think. The late 60s or something. You know, yeah, that's the only they sat down and kind of rehearsed it and they, <laughs> and they played the, this concert. And that's the only time they ever did it. But if you listen to them, you'd swear they must have spent hours practicing, you know. Or if you heard them in the hall, you think, well, surely they've gone over this Mahler II chorale a bunch of times. You no, know, just you know, whatever they, whatever they were. Well, they probably played it a hundred times because they yeah. play it so much. But just, just sit down and and play, and they've been doing it so long, they probably know when somebody's going to zig or zag and knew exactly what to do. So, it, yeah, it was, it was, it was a pretty amazing, a pretty amazing sound too. And you get up there and hear hear them live, and especially 
you got to know and realize how individual their sounds were. Kind of yeah. throws all this stuff at oh, everybody's got to use the same equipment or have the right, even the same con. Well, I can say the same concept, but yeah, yeah it was pretty exciting. Why, why you studied with Jake from mid '80s till his his passing? Was there any change in his pedagogical approach that you noticed? I didn't notice for me. It all seemed pretty, um, still pretty that, mu that musically based. You know that s the song in your head and the, and the you know the two instruments, the one in your head and the one in your hand kind of philosophy was pretty much what I did the whole time. I didn't notice any big shift in em emphasis. Um, we didn't talk about that much medical terminology. Basically, if just if I would ask something, he would he would explain something if he thought I wanted to know. It, but he didn't he didn't start from that basis anyway. But yeah. I, I think it's like at one point he says, "Well, I can tell you think you know." We think musically this way, and it's like, oh, I do. I didn't. I didn't even know that. That's good. So, so I wasn't really kind of the analytical. I've got to know what my, what muscles my, you know. You didn't want. You didn't. You didn't have a need to know why. Yeah, I just had a kind of curiosity, like, gee, I guess I ought to know this stuff, you know. And but it wasn't really as much as my playing. Just so I thought that'd be kind of neat to know. Yeah. What about you? Were we were having breakfast today, and you were mentioning that you're studying. You've been studying in martial arts. Mm -hmm. I've been studying this uh, art. It's, um, uh, Aikido, and actually there's a branch called Key Society Aikido, that is um, really into um, mind-body unification, mind-body coordination, your brain, your mind, and your body doing the same thing at the same time, instead of your brain being spaced out one place and your body doing something else. Um, and I, one reason I got interested in this uh, was probably because I saw the tie-in with the way Mr. Jacobs was teaching, where the, the, your brain, your mind, really is leading what you're doing with your instrument. Uh, is leading, is your mind is leading your body in this respect. Yeah. And so the things we work in in Aikido is kind of this mental calmness and relaxation, but a kind of energetic relaxation, not a collapse, but a, yeah. what we call living relaxation. Um, seem to tie in so much with what I'm trying to do when I'm when I'm playing my instrument, the way that Mr. Jacobs taught us, where you're conceiving the sound in your mind and you're not thinking about, you know, gee, is the conductor going to give glare at me when he gives me the cue, or are the bassoons going to come in right? They aren't. Um, you know, or whatever, or gee, I hope I sound good because, you know, somebody's out in the audience. All that kind of stuff that you don't want going on in your mind, but yeah. which so wants to crowd in there. Yeah. You need to just be thinking solely of the sound in your head when you're playing on the spot. And Aikido is one of these things because the idea is that, you know, originally someone was, you know, hitting you with the sword or something. You know? <laughs> so where if you, if you were spacing out, you know, you were, you know, you got whacked in the head. So that doesn't happen very often in the orchestra, but, um, and there are times you want to wax something in the head, but you don't actually get whacked. But that, um, uh, but that same, that same kind of, in a way, that you know, fight or flight response that can happen when you're under pressure is is the same thing. So I found a lot of links to that in this uh, in this Aikido thing. If you can remain calm um, and focused on what you're doing and remembering what you're supposed to be doing when someone's attacking you, and then using your Aikido techniques, easier to remain kind of a transfer to remaining calm when you're under pressure and you want to sound really great. Um, when you're playing your instrument, and it comes from the same spot of keeping that con that calm mind, so you can have that concept in your head. Because if your mind is jibber jabbering all over the place, you can't conceive the sound in your in your brain. Right. Yeah. So the louder that you can turn up the volume of the sound that you want on the trombone in your mind, then the yeah. louder that the sound is going to come out the the real trombone. Yeah. And just and even I remember, cause I remember even when it's even when it's soft, Jacob was talking about. The, it, in your brain, it's loud, even yeah. if it's coming out soft. But keeping that, and that drowns out everything out. And right. but it's easy. It's it's hard to go from the <laughs> freaked out state to okay, your Zen state. Where now I'm the Zen master of the trombone. I'm going to play, you know, Valero perfectly or whatever. So you've got to this. Uh, a lot of this is, is training you that your natural state is a lot more calm and relaxed. And I found a lot of however into into both things. So. You know, um, I remember so many times uh, either coming or going from a lesson or sometimes even in the middle of a lesson there would be somebody, you'd meet somebody who's famous, you mm -hmm. know, either they're going to have a lesson or they just finished a lesson or maybe they just stop by to say hello to Jake. Did you ever mm -hmm. have anything like that? I, I did have that. There were times when like, oh, do you know Steve Ture? And he's like, oh, yes, he's really famous. <laughs> you know, or oh, you know Charlie. You know, there were these things like that where there'd be someone before or after you, you never do. Uh, in, one, one, in one case, I was in the midst of a lesson, and there's a knock on the door, and Bob Tucci, former, uh, I think former now, tubist in the Bavarian Opera, for many years, he was there, and then one of his colleagues, who's a horn player in the Bavarian Opera, 
were in town just for a visit and they stopped by to say hello. So we said, oh, come on in. This is Wyatt Anderson of the Kansas City Symphony. And, and so they sat down and, and we played some, played some stuff. And it was kind of a, an excuse for him to say no, you know, to kind of do his little teaching method of like, so make sure you flood your brain with the opening note before you And then they, they says, why don't you play some Ride of the Valkyrie? These, are, these, these boys playing the opera all that. I played Ride of the Valkyrie. And, they, and so he would give comments, but then Bob Tucci would say, well, you know, we do it a little more like this. Okay. He says, "Oh, well, let's see. What, what else you play?" He says, "Oh, what, what I think play the Lohengrin." Da, 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 da. So, like, I'm in my got my Wagner book, uh-huh. excerpt book, and so they're they're calling out Wagner excerpts, and I'm kind of going through the Wagner book, playing different stuff, some of which I hadn't played for a while. But so you had Jake, you had Tucci, and the horn, and the horn, and horn player, a triple play. Yeah, a triple play, and of course, I think, ah, yes. So, like, they talk, you know, he would sometimes say, you know, imagine, you know, Zubin made is right around the corner, going to offer you a job. Well. Sometimes maybe there was somebody around the corner, or in this case, in the studio, who uh, who could potentially potentially could offer you a job, I suppose. So yeah, it was, but it actually went it went pretty well. So uh, it was nice at the end. And Jake says, "Oh, what do you think?" And they said, "Oh, where do we send the contract?" I said, "I'll write the address." <laughs> they, they didn't have a contract to send, unfortunately. Okay. So. Well, we're glad so, you're here. So, yes, yeah, so I'm here in some Munich, but uh, yeah, well. but uh, but it was but it was like I say, you never know, and and of course. That increases the talking about increasing the pressure in your lesson because of course I mean you don't want to sound bad for him but you certainly don't want to tank it in front of you know some yeah. some esteemed uh, professional players there. So. Exactly. Well, man, it's so great to see you. We haven't seen each other since eighty. I, th- I left for Savannah in late '86 and you left for Grand Rapids early. Yeah, in '87. So yeah, I don't think so. Man. Well, Puddles has directed me to uh, to give you uh, this uh, wonderful University of Oregon. Beerstein that uh, has a picture of um, Autzen Stadium. Yeah, right. uh, that this is where the this is where the Ducks play, and this is where he does all his push-ups. Okay. For mm-hmm. every point that the team scores, he has to do a push-up. Oh wow! And, uh, and they score a lot of points. At they score a lot of points, and and they say it never rains on Autzen. Hmm. Uh, but anyway, please accept this with our oh well, thank you. Our thanks. Will, I'm sure those will get plenty of good use. Very good. Great to see you. Good to see you, Mike. Yeah, very good. Now back to you. How did you demonstrate? You know the the two lines in terms of. Well, let me think. with stuff, some of it's like the, like getting your oral cavity open, you know, like the key in the keyhole, you know, that kind of a yeah. thing, and the the that kind of idea. I remember that. Yeah. Um. We used, I mean, we used like the breath builder. Remember yeah. that? That's one of the things I still use a lot in the gizmo. Just getting that getting that yeah. flow. I still use that a lot, yeah. actually. Yeah. Just kind of get the airflow and uh, and. Uh, you just get them moving the air in and out, and I think of that, you know, like the the thing in the thirds, you know, we use the right hand. Right, the thirds, yeah. As the right. thirds, I do that. I still do that one a lot. I my, my, actually, my daughter plays trombone. So oh, Playing okay. trombone, so I experiment a little bit on her <laughs> sometimes. Although, now, since it's since I don't know anything, since I'm her dad, it's, it's hard if she's working on trombone with me or math with her mom. It's hard to tell either of us, you don't know what you're talking about. Because it's like, um, well, yeah. <laughs> Some stuff I may know what I'm talking about, but this I do. Twelve year old. Twelve year old, yeah. yeah. But uh, that's great. But it's fun, so I can kind of like say, all right, you know, if I not the theory, because I don't teach very many beginners, you know. Yeah. But it's like, okay, I have a beginner right here in my own house. I can. <laughs> I'll, I'll try this. It's good. And, it's and, it, and, it, and, it, and it actually works really well. The times that are most successful is like do stuff like, okay, I'll play the lip slur, and then you play the lip slur, and go back and forth, and it uh, always sounds like you know a gazillion times better than when she just sits and plays it by herself. Yeah. So. So, uh, excellent. Mm-hmm. Excellent. I might use that. This little, this little tag. Oh, okay. Is it okay? Sure. If we uh, include the part about your daughter, or should we oh, cut, sure. cut that out before? No, you can leave it. You can leave it. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. She, she knows. She knows. Okay. All right. <laughs>